Folk, we have been wonderfully blessed this week, night by night, and uh, those of you who were here last Sabbath as John has ministered to us and uh, as Pamela over the last uh, couple of mornings and around the ground and with others has ministered to us also. And, you know, uh, sometimes we think these people come and they stand up here and uh, they sort of come from another place and a little bit of that, you know, we lift them up onto another level and think they're superhuman people, but they're just like you and I. Uh, they've left their three children behind to come here and to minister to us here at camp. And while they've been here, John's mother has been uh, taken off into hospital. So the ordinary things that happen in our lives happen in theirs as well. And uh, just in this little moment, on behalf of all of us here, John and Pamela, we just want to say a special thank you for coming. Thank you for giving up your, uh, shall we say, relaxation time when you could be on holidays or a break. You've come here and uh, I just think of Paul when he said, you know, the, they were saying, come on over and minister to us. Mm -hmm. uh, you've responded and we just want to say thank you. There's a little gift. We know that you're interested in cowrie. You went up and had a look at the forest. There's a little piece of it in here mm -hmm. for you. When you go back home, <laughs> it'll be a memory for you. Right. God bless. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, uh, during the singing this morning, I leaned over to my wife and I said to her, you know, it sure has felt like heaven an awful lot this week, hasn't it? And she agreed with me. And I want to give a special word of thanks to our musicians here at this camp. They have done an incredible job this week. And I intend to report back to Sam Bakayoki that in the South Pacific you can have great music without drums. <laughs> and I just have to tell you that after mentioning that to my wife, uh, I didn't sing anymore because the tears were running down my cheeks. And they were tears of joy, of the, the fellowship that we have in Jesus. And I, I just want to testify a little bit here and, and tell you that if you ever see a man crying, he's not a sissy, he's alive. No one has ever accused me of being a sissy. I was born with the personality of a German field marshal. The song, I am a rock, I am an island, applied to me. And God sent me a little lady who has taught me what being alive is all about. And I want to say that in honor of her. Um, she's rumored to be 35 years of age. <laughs> she and I love that rumor. <laughs> but uh, God used her, the pain that she experienced... Uh, the challenges uh, in her life, God used that to wake me up to real life. And in some ways, you haven't seen that side of me this week. We've been more academic and, and looking at the scholarly issues and so forth. But the kinds of things that she has shared are very close to me in my life. And uh, God has uh, brought me to the place, I believe, where I'm really alive. And I can cry at a cartoon with the kids and stuff like that, and just because what you feel is what you are. And uh, sometimes we're taught to feel shame and so forth for, for things that are natural and God-given. So don't be afraid to be alive. Don't be afraid to look your past in the eye. Don't be afraid to deal with the real issues and grow in Jesus Christ every day. And I just want to tell you that uh, this week in big camp to us, has been a little piece of heaven. And I think it all started in the cowrie forest where my wife just said, this is my personal image of what heaven would be like. Just seeing those tree ferns along the road and the beautiful flowers and, and uh, the vegetation and so forth. So thank you for sharing yourselves and your little piece of heaven here in New Zealand. God bless you all. And thank you for that kind gift. Now we'll switch over to the left brain.
<laughs> because I think, I think one, of the, one of the things that happens when you're really alive, you use all parts of the brain and you, you, get, you can feel and understand with people whatever their natural gifts and their natural background. And I thank God that we can grow uh, in these ways. Let's talk about the Sabbath. We're here on the Sabbath day. We're here because we enjoy being here on the Sabbath day. And a question that often arises is, well, we have often talked about the Sabbath in the book of Revelation, that somehow it will be a central issue, but the term Sabbath never appears in the book. So where did that come from? Is that something Ellen White made up? Or is it really the issue in the final crisis verse history? And if so, why would it be that issue? I'd like to share a little bit with you this morning about that. Basic reality. Start from the, from the basics. In Revelation, there will be a great end time deception. We talked about that last Sabbath. Those of you who are here, only the two Sabbaths, it will fit uh, nicely together, uh, even if you haven't been here during the week. There's a great end time deception. In that end time deception, uh, there will be great difficulty in determining just where God is acting. Uh, who is the true God? Is it the true Trinity? Is it the unholy Trinity and its powerful manifestations on this earth? And what we left last Sabbath is that we weren't exactly sure what the crucial issue is. Will the people of God have a means by which they can tell the truth from the counterfeit in the last days? The basic principle of studying the book of Revelation is that the book of Revelation is based on the experiences of God's people in the Old Testament. So in the book of Revelation, you will find Jerusalem, you will find Sodom and Egypt, you'll find Jezebel, uh, you'll find Elijah there, and so forth. The characters of the Old Testament, the events of the Old Testament, the places of the Old Testament are important background information to understanding the book of Revelation. If you want to understand Revelation, you need to understand the Old Testament along with it. So Revelation's filled with the language, ideas, places, and people of the Old Testament. But there's a problem. And the problem is this. The book of Revelation never quotes the Old Testament. In fact, there's one place where it seems to. In Revelation 15, it talks about the Song of Moses. And then you listen to the song, expecting to hear Exodus 15, and instead you hear a collage of passages from Psalms and Isaiah. So there's never once a quotation of the Old Testament. There is just allusion to it. In other words, a word here, a phrase there, a name somewhere else. As I illustrated sometime during the week, you can, with one word, bring a whole historical context to mind. For example, Monica. You see? That one word, why would I say that word if it's not referring to a whole historical context that people around the world are familiar with? You can take a word, a phrase, a name, as I just did, and evoke a whole big picture. That's how the book of Revelation uses the Old Testament. Through hints, here and there, it evokes a whole big picture. And when you grasp that big picture, you will understand what the book of Revelation teaches. Those who don't know the Old Testament will have difficulty understanding the book. But here's the problem. How do you know when the author intends to allude to the Old Testament? I remember I tried this in Australia a couple of years ago, and I said, Monica, and everybody was confused. They weren't sure what I was talking about. Do you know why? It was the week of the Australian Open, and the winner was Monica Sellis. So the illustration went totally flat. You know, Aussies are usually noisy people, as uh, some of you know. And, uh, you know, I, no response. You know, I was saying, well, at least a chuckle or two would help. You see, and then somebody explained to me, well, what Monica are you talking about? So you can come to the question, how do you know when the author uses a word or a name that it's referring to this Monica and not that one? That can be a problem. And we want to take a look at that today. 
uh, briefly as a preparation for our study on the Sabbath. Let's use an example of how Revelation uses the Old Testament. I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the names of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like a bear, and his mouth was like a lion. If you take a look at the colored items here, the green and the, uh, the pink there, you will see a whole number of things coming up out of the sea. Ten horns, seven heads, leopard, bear, lion. Does that sound familiar at all? Is there any place in the Old Testament you're going to find those things? In Daniel 7. Daniel 7 has four beasts that come up out of the sea. Three of them are a lion, a bear, and a leopard. But what about these ten horns and seven heads? Well, you had the lion there, you had the bear, you had the leopard, and you had, I don't know what you'd call it, a bizarre, strange beast that doesn't look like anything you have in the cowrie forests. <laughs> so here you have four animals in Daniel, three of which are mentioned in the text in Revelation. And then notice this. Let's think heads for a moment. How many heads does a lion have? One head. The bear? One head. Leopard? Four heads. Hope I don't see that down in the South Island. And finally, the bizarre beast has one head. All right, let's do the math. One plus one plus four plus one equals seven. The four beasts of Daniel 7 have a total of seven heads. You see, the beast of Revelation 13 is a composite beast. It combines elements of all four in Daniel 7. Well, let's think horns. Okay, the lion had how many horns? Well, that would be strange if they had horns. Bear? No horns. Leopard? No horns. Mr. Bizarro? Ten horns. Well, let's do the math once more. Zero plus zero plus zero plus ten equals ten. The four beasts of Daniel 7 have a total of ten horns. So when you have a single beast, looks like a lion, a bear, and a leopard, has seven heads, ten horns, it is a composite beast combining elements of uh, all four beasts of Daniel 7. So remember the text in Revelation 13? I saw a beast coming up out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads. This beast in Revelation 13 is based on Daniel 7. The beasts of Daniel 7 come out of the sea. There's a lion. There's a bear. There's a leopard. Seven heads in each case. Ten horns in each case. So can we be reasonably certain that the author of Revelation 13 wants you to know about Daniel 7? I think so. And on what basis can we be reasonably certain? There's a whole bunch of words and ideas all packaged together. All right? So in the book of Revelation, there are places like Revelation 13 where I think we can be absolutely certain exactly what part of the Old Testament is in mind. Seems clear here? Revelation 13 builds on the vision of Daniel 7. But how do you make such judgments? Especially when the evidence is less clear than it is in Revelation 13. All right, that's a clear one. But what if it's just one word or a phrase? What then? Let's have a look. You look for three pieces of evidence. First of all, are what we'd call verbal parallels, where there are words in common. Second, there's thematic parallels, where you have ideas in common. And finally, there are structural parallels, where you have the text in Revelation seems to be structured on the text in the Old Testament. It seems to be following that text in the same order. So there's three types of evidence that you look for if you're building a case for what part of the Old Testament uh, the book of Revelation is, is going after. And, and let me just tell you, it may seem like an awful lot of work. You know, and is it worth it? If you would see some of the pastors that have been through the classes at the seminary, and I've required them to put in 30 or 40 hours of work doing this, 
And one of the greatest experiences I have in life is to see one of those pastors come to the class with a lit up face and saying, I've got it, I've got it, I understand how this thing works. It's the first time I ever learned directly from the Bible. I've always read books about the Bible, and I've preached from other books and stuff, but I studied the Bible and I learned from myself. You think that would be worth 30, 40 hours? I think so. There's nothing more exciting than the Bible opening itself up before your eyes. And you can go to somebody else and say, look what I saw, and they'll look at it and say, yeah, you're right. I see that too. And sometimes we apply our fantasies to the Bible. Look what I've seen here. And the person says, huh? Where'd you come up with that? You see? Well, the method I'm sharing with you brings evidence out of the text that people look at and they agree. It says, that's definitely there. You know, I really, I can see that too. And you know, secular people, they often think that uh, Christians sort of make it up as they go along. When you can take a secular person and show them step by step what the Bible is actually teaching, they get excited. Say, this is fun and I'm learning so much about how to live. So there's, there's a path here whereby Bible study can become an exciting piece of our life. Doesn't mean you have to turn off the television forever. But I rather suggest as we approach the end times, if we're spending more time with the television than we are with the Bible, we may be feeding ourselves an unnatural diet. And certainly if scripture study is well balanced in our lives, a little relaxation entertainment may not be uh, such a bad thing. So let's take a look at these three. Verbal parallels. Basically, the principle here is where you have two or more major words in common between a particular text and the Old Testament. That would be a verbal parallel. Why two? Simply to make it a little less complicated. If you were to look up every word of a text in the entire Old Testament, you'd probably be spending a thousand hours on each text. And most of us don't have time for that. And the neat thing about it is most of the illusions have at least two words. So if you're looking for two words in common as a basis for checking the Old Testament background, you have uh, a much simpler approach that is just as effective as the more difficult one. So verbal parallels where there are two or more major words in common. What do I mean by major? Well, not and or the. You know, major words. Uh, things like lion and bear and leopard uh, those would be major words. You see two of those in common between the Old Testament and Revelation, and you've got a strong uh, parallel. In Revelation 13, look at the major words in common. Sea, lion, bear, leopard, heads, horns. And if you do a little math, you've even got the ten and the seven that fit as well. Although maybe we should call that thematic parallels. So you look for words that are in common. You take a text in Revelation, you take a text in the Old Testament that seems similar, and uh, you, uh, you have a look. One way to do this, make it simple, is if your Bible has a margin. Do you have, do you have a margin in your Bible where it gives you texts elsewhere in the Bible that are parallel to this? Okay, start with a margin in the Bible or start with a commentary on Revelation and look for the Old Testament texts that are suggested there but don't take their word for it. You're probably a better scholar than they were anyway. You see? And take that Old Testament text, lay it side by side with the text of Revelation, and see, are there words in common? Is there a verbal parallel there? And mark down and look for those, uh, and you will find this a fascinating study. Uh, it's, it's kind of as exciting as playing a Nintendo game, because you never know what mystery will unlock next. Thematic parallels are where you have a clear parallel of ideas. You may not have words in common, but the idea of revelation is found somewhere else in the Bible. Of the, of the three, this is the weakest all by itself. It usually helps to have a word or two and helps to have some structural uh, basis, which we'll talk about in a minute. But still, this can be a helpful piece of evidence. And in Revelation 13, you have the theme of animals coming out of the sea and representing world powers. That's a theme in common between the two texts. Combined with all those words we've seen, it makes you feel all that more secure that Revelation really has Daniel 7 in mind in chapter 13. Structural parallels are where you have a number of words and themes in parallel and in roughly the same order. This is very strong evidence. 
I'll give you an example of a structural parallel. In Revelation 8 and 9, the seven trumpets, you're all interested in the seven trumpets? In the seven trumpets, there is a background in the Old Testament that sits behind the whole thing. You know what that is? The plagues of the Exodus. In the plagues of the Exodus, you have hail coming down from heaven and catching fire on the earth. You have water turning into blood. Uh, you have the death of the firstborn and so forth. The plagues of the Exodus are seen in the trumpets. You know, water turning to blood, hail and blood mixed with fire being thrown to the earth, uh, bitter water and so forth. So the trumpets seem to be based on the Exodus experience. What does that mean? Anytime you think there's a parallel text between the trumpets and the Exodus, the chances are greater that you're right because the trumpets often refer to the Exodus. All right, that's a structural parallel. And that's very strong evidence because if Revelation keeps going back to the same text, the chances that there's a connection are that much stronger. In Revelation 13, you have numerous and striking parallels even though not exactly the same order. Daniel 7 is also a frequent point of reference in the book. Daniel 7 is referenced in Revelation 1, in Revelation 4, in Revelation 5, and in Revelation 17. So throughout the book of Revelation, Daniel 7 keeps showing up, not just in chapter 13. So Daniel 7 would seem to be a structural parallel, a background text that's very important to the author of Revelation. So here we see the evidence. You put all that evidence together, and I think any honest scholar is going to say, Revelation 13 is working with Daniel 7. All right, so that's the basic principle. Now, I want to get to the text for the day. We'll start with Revelation 12, 17. The dragon was angry with the woman. He went away to make war with the remnant of her seed, those who keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus. As we've noted before, there's a basically two sides in this final battle. The dragon and the remnant. So the dragon and everybody that's on his side is against the remnant, everybody that uh, is on God's side in the final crisis. And we notice that the remnant keeps the commandments of God, has the testimony of Jesus. Now, as we've noticed uh, earlier in the week, Revelation 12, 17 is sort of a nutshell summary of the two chapters that follow. The dragon and his war are summarized in Revelation 13. The remnant and their side of the final battle, their response to it, is what Revelation 14 is all about. The three angels' message is the heart of the remnant's response in the final crisis of earth's history. Now let me tell you a little secret. Many scholars who have studied Revelation, including Roman Catholic scholars, have come to the belief that the central part of Revelation is the key to the book, and that's chapters 12 through 14. That the central part of the book of Revelation, the key to the book, is 12 through 14. Here's where you find the basic method and purpose of the book. I know at least two Roman Catholic scholars that tell me that there's a center to the center of Revelation. You know what they say that is? The three angels' messages. Is the center of the center. Whenever a Roman Catholic is studying their Bible rightly, I want to agree with them. Don't you? You see? And one of the beautiful things I have seen in Roman Catholic biblical scholars today is they have been freed to study the Bible honestly and openly, more so than many Protestant scholars who are always got the eye going back to the denominational um, ideas, you know, the pet ideas, and, and, and have trouble seeing what the text is saying sometimes because it seems to go against what they believe. I see in Roman Catholic scholars sometimes an openness to take the text wherever it goes. They say, Oh, central passage of Revelation, three angels' messages. And I look at them and say, amen. <laughs> I, I can go with that. I think that's, that's probably as good as it gets. But you know what? I'll take you one step further. I believe there's a center of the center of the center. I believe that within the three angels' messages, one piece that's more important than all the rest, 
And I want to demonstrate that this morning because you will find that text brings us right to the heart of Adventist identity. And it's one of the clearest aspects of Adventist identity to share with neighbors and friends. You remember that we discovered last Sabbath an unholy trinity, the dragon, a counterfeit of God the Father, sea beast, a counterfeit of God the Son, land beast, a counterfeit of the Holy Spirit. So you have false trinity against true trinity in the final crisis of earth's history. And according to the text and the last days of earth's history, the unholy trinity will attack the remnant and attempt to destroy it. There will be a great battle at the end of time. And in this great battle, uh, there will be uh, an attack upon the remnant. Now let me just aside for a minute here. Because many Seventh-day Adventists have grown up with a great fear of that final battle. A great fear of that final battle. And one of the key messages of Revelation I must underline is that according to the book of Revelation, God is in control of life and death. Jesus is the one who has the keys of death and Hades. No one goes in to the realm of the dead. That's what Hades was in Hebrew thinking. No one goes into the realm of the dead unless Jesus opens the key. Is that good news? That means, first of all, that if Jesus doesn't want you to die, Osama bin Laden can't do a thing about it. That's a fact. Jesus holds the key, according to the book of Revelation. So we don't need to go into the final crisis afraid of what might happen to us. Yes, Jesus holds the key. He's not going to allow anything to happen to us that would be more than we could handle. And that's the other side. That's the other side of the, the message. Just a little aside I want to share with you. I believe that one of the spiritual gifts is the gift of martyrdom. You can only exercise that gift once. But when you see some of the great saints of history and the tortures that they suffered, and it was almost as if they didn't feel the pain. Compare John Huss with Servetus. John Huss and Servetus were two men that were burned at the stake in the course of the Middle Ages and the the early Reformation. John Huss was the great reformer, and he stood with the flames engulfing him, singing hymns until his breath went out. It was as if... He didn't feel the pain. He had the gift of martyrdom. Servetus, the heretic, the one who opposed the Reformation, when he was burned at the stake, screamed for 30 hours, 30 minutes in his dying agonies. A very tragic, tragic story. So if it should be that God should call one of us to make the ultimate sacrifice, we can know it will not be more than we can bear. We will be given what it takes to go through that time. You know, heroes don't usually choose themselves. Heroes are chosen by circumstances, and God gives them what they need to become heroes when the time comes. Let's not fear the future. Let's not fear the end-time battle. When it comes, Jesus holds the keys, and God will be with us and give us whatever it takes. There will be such an attack. The remnant will come under great distress and persecution. But what is the basic issue in this attack? How can we know where the truth lies? I'd like to suggest that Revelation 13 and 14 do not leave us in any doubt. Revelation 13, 4. They worshipped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, verse 8, Everyone who lives on the earth will worship him. Are you getting the drift? Revelation 13, 12. He will cause the earth and those who live in it to worship the first beast. Verse 15. In order that the image of the beast might speak and might cause anyone who does not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Verse 14. Verse 9 of chapter 14. If anyone worships the beast in his image. Verse 11. Those who worship the beast in his image. Do you notice over and over again the central issue in the battle between the dragon and the remnant is what? Worship. By the way, how many times does it appear? Do the math. One, two, three, four, five, six, 
Seven. Seven times, a magical number for Revelation. Seven times there's a call to worship the beast. Is that significant? Let's go on and see. The issue in the final crisis of earth's history is clearly worship. Seven times in Revelation 13 and 14 there's a call to worship the beast and or his image. Only once in these chapters is there a call to worship God. Does that mean that's less important than worshiping the beast? No. You know what it means? It means this one text is the most important text in this whole section of Revelation. It's the center of the center of the center. If the whole context is the attack of the dragon on the remnant and the beast's attempt to gain worship for itself, God's call to worship him has to be the crucial text, the crucial call in this entire section. And we find that in Revelation 14 and verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. Several of you mentioned creation in the video that we saw. Right on, good on you for doing that. Worshiping the creator is the central call of God in the center of the book of Revelation. This is the key text. This is the thing that is most important in this entire section. The call to worship here makes this verse the central affirmation of this section of Revelation, perhaps the central appeal of the whole book. So if the three angels' messages is the center of the center, and if we can agree with our non-Adventist friends that that is the case, I challenge them to note that there's a center of the center of the center, and that's the call to worship the Creator. The key affirmation of the whole book. But now I want you to see something special. Because this latter part of Revelation 14, 7 is an allusion to an Old Testament text, one that we're quite familiar with. For in six days... The Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Do you see the common words between those texts? Revelation 14, 7 is an allusion to the fourth commandment in Exodus 20, the Sabbath commandment. At the very heart of God's call to the people at the end of the world, to worship and serve Him is an allusion to the fourth commandment. Notice the words in common, the verbal parallels. Him and the Lord made heaven, earth, sea. Four and a half major words in common between Revelation 14 and Exodus 20. In a book that never quotes, four and a half words is almost a chapter. I mean, that is a major connection between Revelation and the Old Testament. So we have a decisive call here. At the decisive center point of the book of Revelation is a direct allusion to the fourth commandment. You all familiar with the internet? Well, a lot of stuff goes on on the internet. And apparently some folk on the internet heard about my teaching on the subject. And they sent in some objections saying, no, 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 Revelation 14 is not alluding to the fourth commandment. It's not the ideal response to God's final call to worship to keep the Sabbath. Surely not. That's not what it is saying. I believe that's exactly what it is saying. But do you know what the critique was? Let me share it with you so that we would have no doubts as to what Revelation is talking about. Is Revelation 14, 7 really alluding to the fourth commandment? Wait a minute. Doesn't Psalm 146, 6 contain exactly the same language? What if the author of Revelation was alluding to Psalm 146 instead of the fourth commandment? Would that make a difference? I think it would. It would make a big difference as to what exactly this worshiping of the Creator was supposed to be. 
Let's check it out. It's true. Psalm 146, 6 has the same phrase as Exodus 20, 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. Psalm 146, 6, the maker of heaven, earth, the sea, and everything in them. Do you see that? Exodus 20 and Psalm 146 sure look pretty similar. Well, let's check it out. Let's test it out. Let's find out. I want to illustrate for you how one goes about trying to get inside the mind of John and see exactly what he was thinking when he wrote these words. Verbal parallels. Let's have a look. Revelation 14, 7 has four and a half words in common with Exodus 20 and verse 11. Look at Psalm 146, 6. The maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. What do you think? Which of those was Revelation alluding to? Exodus 20 or Psalm 146? It's kind of a close call, isn't it? In fact, the verbal parallels to both Old Testament passages are strong. And I have to be honest with you. In the Greek language... The words of Psalm 146.6 are identical to Revelation 14. Exodus 20 is just a little bit different. So if you want to go by verbal parallels, Revelation 14 is slightly closer to Psalm 146 than it is to uh, Exodus 20. Uh Uh-oh, maybe I've been wasting your time this morning. Well, let's look at thematic parallels. Are there some themes in common between Revelation 14 and these Old Testament texts? Look at the first table of the law, Exodus 20. First of all, you have the theme of salvation. I brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, therefore, have no other gods before me. All right? The reason to keep the commandments, the reason to keep the Sabbath is because God brought us out of Egypt. With a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm. He saved us. Therefore, he should be our God, not somebody else. What about judgment? There's a theme of judgment in the second commandment. That you should not bow down or worship idols because God visits the iniquity of the fathers unto the children, unto the third and fourth generation and all of that. So it's a theme of judgment. Sort of a carrot and a stick. You know, salvation is all these good things have happened to you, so follow me. Judgment is more like, I've got a paddle in my hand, so you better move in that direction quickly. You know, there's uh, two sides sometimes, salvation and judgment as motivations. The sanctions of the first table are motivations to keep them. We ought to keep them because he saved us. We ought to keep them because judgment is coming. And finally, creation. Keep the Sabbath because in six days God made the world and rested on the seventh day. Take a look at Revelation 14, and you will see the same three themes from the first table of the law. I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven having what? The everlasting gospel. What's that? Salvation. He says with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Salvation, judgment, Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. The same themes that you find in the first table of the law are found in Revelation 14. Let's look at it. Out of the house of bondage, the everlasting gospel, theme of salvation. Visiting the iniquity, hour of his judgment, the theme of judgment. The language is not the same. These are themes in parallel. For in six days, him who made... So the themes of salvation, judgment, and creation are in common between Revelation 14 and the fourth commandment. Are you relieved? Only for a minute. Let's go to Psalm 146. And lo and behold, you will find the same three themes in Psalm 146. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortal men who cannot save Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord is God. The maker of heaven and earth, he upholds the cause of the oppressed. So you see the theme of salvation, the theme of creation, the theme of judgment. Same three themes. I think it's a little closer to the fourth commandment, don't you? 
I mean, the themes are a little stronger connected, I think, to Exodus 20. But Psalm 146, that's real. All right, so when you look at thematic parallels, both passages have strong thematic parallels. But there's a slight edge this time to Exodus 20. Well, the soccer game's kind of one-to-one with a minute left. What's going to happen here? Let's go to the third piece of evidence, and that is structural parallels. Let's look at the evidence of Revelation 12 through 14. Is there an underlying structure in Revelation 12 through 14 that would point us to either of these passages as being the closer one? Let's have a look. First of all, Revelation 12, 17. The remnant are those who keep the commandments of God. The saints are those who keep the commandments of God. All right? So at both ends of this passage, we see reference to the commandments. The commandments are a structural background in the setting of Revelation 12, 13, and 14. Worship is a major theme in Revelation 13 and 14. And worship is at the heart of the first table of the law. It has to do with our relationship to God. Second table of the law has to do with our relationship to others. So the first table of the law is focused on the issue of worship. Not only that, in Revelation 13, you find the beasts of Revelation 13 counterfeiting the first table of the law. Look at this. What's the first commandment? Have no other gods before me, right? What does the beast say? Worship me. Don't worship God, worship me. That's a counterfeit of the first commandment. Second commandment, don't bow down to images. What does the beast do? Sets up an image and requires people to worship. Third commandment, do not take the name of the Lord in vain. What does this beast do? Full of blasphemy. Fourth commandment, the seal of God. In Deuteronomy 6, It says a very interesting thing. It says, Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you shall teach these things to your children. You should bind them upon your foreheads and upon your hands. The things of the first table of the law to be bound on the forehead and the hand. What does the beast do to everybody? Marks the forehead or the hand. It's a deliberate counterfeit of the first table of the law. In every covenant contract in ancient times, at the heart of the contract was the author of the contract and the territory that the contract was concerned with. In the commandments, you'll find that as the Sabbath command. It is the Sabbath that identifies who the king of this covenant is, who is the one to be worshipped, and why, because he made the heavens and the earth. So there's a powerful structural basis behind Revelation 12, 13, and 14. The commandments lie behind everything that's going on there. What about Psalm 146? Let's have a look at these two options. Verbal parallels. Strong verbal parallels between Revelation 14 and Exodus 20. Very strong parallels with Psalm 146. Thematic. Very strong parallels to Exodus 20. Strong parallels to Psalm 146.6. All right, it's 1-1, last minute of the game. Structural parallels. Very strong background to Exodus 20. Psalm 146, none. You see, when you look at all the evidence, it becomes clear that the criticism did not go deep enough. That in actual fact, the deeper you go into this text, the more clear it becomes that the fourth commandment is, in fact, the crucial background. No illusion in Revelation, I would say, is more certain than the illusion to the fourth commandment in Revelation 14, verse 7. God's final call to the world is a call to worship in the context of what? The fourth commandment. So, folk... We are not just gathering on any day of the week. Our gathering here together today is a testimony that one day the whole world will be called to worship the one who made heaven, earth, the sea, 
and the fountains of waters. We are a living witness in anticipation of the final battle of earth's history. But I have to ask the question, if New Zealand is one of the two most secular nations on earth, I have to ask the question, does it make any sense? If BCNN had gone downtown Auckland and said to the people, what does the Sabbath mean to you? What kind of answers would they get? Or try this question. Do you think people should go to church on Saturday or on Sunday? What would the typical secular person's response be? Why would you go to church at all? You mean you guys fight about that stuff? I can't believe it. You see, the typical secular person would listen to what we're sharing here and say, I don't know, that doesn't make much sense to me. Why would God choose one day over another to make a distinction between his people and those who in the end will go another direction? I would say there are reasons. Crucial to that is it's an ideal test of loyalty to God. An ideal test of loyalty to God. What do I mean by that? All the other nine commandments are logical and reasonable, aren't they? I mean, if you don't want to be killed, you would be ill-advised to go around killing other people, right? I mean, if you want your life to be respected, you ought to respect the lives of others. That makes sense to me. I think the average person in Auckland would agree with that. No, I, don't, I don't think we should go around killing people. And uh, if we want our property to be respected, we shouldn't go around stealing other people's property. That makes sense to me. I think it makes sense to the average person on the street. And if God is really who he claims to be, then why worship somebody else? Why set up an idol? <laughs> why blaspheme his name? It makes no sense. There's only one commandment that seems a bit more arbitrary, if you will. And that is the call to worship on Saturday rather than on Sunday. It makes no scientific sense. If you go up in a spaceship, today doesn't look any different than yesterday did. It doesn't look any different than tomorrow will look. There's no scientific difference between Saturday and Sunday. So what are we dealing with? Something as simple as a date. You know, if I set up a date with my wife, we're going to meet at such and such a time and such and such a place. And if I decide, yeah, Saturday's not convenient, I think I'll show up on Sunday. You think she'll be there? Not my wife. <laughs> Stand her up once and uh, you've got a lot of apologizing to do. <laughs> you see? And rightly so. I, I wouldn't do that by choice. But it's also nice to have a little fear in it too. Be sure that you're there when you're supposed to be there. That's good. But you see, that's arbitrary, isn't it? Why should she expect me to be there on Saturday? Because you've got to make a date to get together. And God's day is special not because it's scientifically superior. It's special because he's inviting us to a party on his day. It's like the birthday of the world, as some people suggested. He's asking us, let's get together, let's have a party together, let's have a date, let's go out to eat, let's do stuff together, you see? And if you show up on the wrong day, you just might miss him, all right? So one reason why I think the Sabbath is a crucial issue in the final crisis, it's a great test of loyalty, because loyalty is tested where there's no self-interest involved. Let me show you what I mean. Let me say that uh, in the president's car, in the boot, I've learned a little bit of your language, uh, in the boot of his car, I have placed a million New Zealand dollars, cash, all right? Now, if you are loyal to me, I demand loyalty of you. Now, to show that you're going to be loyal to me, I insist that you take this key out of my hand. Go over to that car, open it up, take the money, and go out and spend it on yourself. Would that be a good test of loyalty? Nah, I don't think so. I'd go spend it anyway, whether or not I was loyal. You see? There's self-interest involved there. The real test of loyalty is in something that doesn't seem to matter. The only reason it matters is because your friend asked you to do it that way. 
That's a good test of loyalty. And that's why the Sabbath is different from all the other commands. It's the one command uh, that which, in which God can say, well, if you really love me, you'll do it because you love me. There's no other reason to do it. Just because you love me, you'll show up when I ask you to. That's a test of loyalty. And in the final crisis of Earth's history, there will be such a test of loyalty. We accept the Sabbath purely on the basis of God's word. A good test of our trust in God and his word. You know there's one other reason I like for keeping the Sabbath? I don't think I put it on the screen. That reason is this. My obedience to God is heartfelt and sincere, but it isn't always perfect. Maybe you're different. But I'm glad that Jesus kept the Sabbath and that his perfect Sabbath keeping stands like an umbrella over mine. I'm glad that in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, I'm perfectly keeping the Sabbath day in his righteousness. You know, the problem is, if I decided to keep Sunday, Jesus never did. There's no imputed righteousness for Sunday keeping. Jesus kept the Sabbath. And when I'm keeping the Sabbath, his perfect righteousness stands over me. It's not a legalistic thing, but it's rejoicing in following after Jesus in the very thing he chose to do when he was here on this earth. Those who accept and obey the word of God Those who take God at his word, those who rejoice in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, will not lose their way in the end time deception. Remember that deception looked really serious last week? And you begin to wonder, you know, will we be led astray? No, not if we're faithful to God, faithful to his commandments, and resting in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. On this last Sabbath of big camp, I want to tell you that it's a privilege and a responsibility to be a Seventh-day Adventist. It's a privilege to know that God cared enough about people on this earth to prepare the way for the final stages of earth's history. And I thank God that to be a part of that group that brings that message to the world. It doesn't mean we're better than other people. It doesn't mean we could never be lost ourselves. It simply means God has been willing to entrust us with this incredible message by which he's preparing the world for the final events of earth's history. And I invite you this morning to renew your commitment to the identity of Adventism. And if there are some of you, I know there are many of you here that are not directly identified with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. At this point in time, I invite you to think seriously about what you've heard this week about the tremendous identity that God has given to a people, the the incredible role that he has set before us to make a difference in today's world. In the secular world, the number one issue among most people is where's the meaning of life? How can I make a difference in this world? I'll tell you, the Seventh-day Adventist message is making a difference in this world. And I invite you all to be part of it as we approach the last days of Earth's history. May God bless you and keep you to that end. Would you stand as we join together in prayer? Lord, I thank you this morning that we share in common with all believing Christians a joy in the perfect and mighty work of Jesus Christ in our behalf. We thank you that at the cross we have life, we have value, we have righteousness, we have salvation. And out of the joy we have in your mighty acts, O Lord, I pray that you would give us courage to step out and to share what you have done for us and to share the tremendous joy that we can extend that salvation through on the Sabbath day rejoicing in your perfect righteousness for us. So as we rest on this day, in the words of Hebrews, we rest from our labors on this day. We praise your labors in our behalf, your labor of creation, your labor of salvation at the cross. We rejoice in this day and we look forward as camp meeting comes to an end 
to go out into the real world once more and to retain the spirit and the joy that you've shared with us here. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.